Hi, welcome everybody. My name is Susan Barrett. I'm with the Center for Social Behavior Supports at Old Dominion University and one of the partners at the Center for PDIS. And I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Jessica Swain Bradway from Northwest PDIS Network out of Oregon. And we are also um, joined by a special guest who we'll, we'll introduce to you later. And uh, just again, special thanks to you for joining us. And our content facilitator today is Lucille Eber. So let's get started. Welcome to the topic strand. We're so excited to have you today. Um, just to go over again, those virtual forum expectations. We want you to be responsible, respectful, and safe. And um, we want you to take a lot of movement breaks today. We're recognizing that our brains are really full and tired. And so it's really, really important for us to get up and move across the day and stay, and it will really help you stay engaged. We also would love for you to engage with us in chat. Um, let us know what's resonating with you. Let us know what your questions are. We would love for this um, to be as interactive as possible. Hopefully you have found yourself and are navigating the Pathable platform um, pretty, uh, pretty well by now. If you do end up um, getting lost, there is a help support button and you can engage with us in multiple ways, right? We've got the chat feature, but you can ask a specific question under the polls tab. So just uh, again, um, if, if that's too complicated for you, then you can just stay in the chat feature and, and ask us questions there. We've got folks monitoring that. If you accidentally navigate away because you're interested in maybe a social media tweet or um, looking at um, what's coming up next, don't worry. You can always come back um, and click on the person's name. And again, if you find yourself in trouble, support is on the way. We do have a help desk and you can get that in that blue bar up at the top. So with that, um, again, my name is Susan Barrett and I'm introducing the mental health strand. Today, we have three spectacular um, sessions for you lined up. We um, are going to be followed at 115 Central by focusing in on district level implementation and you're not going to want to miss out. We have an amazing, extraordinary exemplar central school district out of Oregon that we're really excited um, to share with you about their story and how they are consolidating their teaming structures and how they are uh, really intentionally designing an integrate, integrated approach. And then the last session of the day will be focused on school level implementation. Again, we have a fantastic um, exemplar and, um, and Lucille Eber is gonna be taking us through that. If that's not enough, we also have some amazing facilitated discussions. So you'll be able to come in a smaller learning community and uh, learn from leaders and exemplars from around the country. We have one specifically on the integration of school mental health and PBIS. We have another one that's focused on building a culture of support for teachers to integrate academic and social emotional behavioral instruction. And then we have one on systemic screening. There are a bunch more, but these are the ones that are kind of focused in on kind of that application of school mental health within a PBIS framework. Okay, so I'm going to set us up and do a little quick overview, kind of that balcony view of what the interconnected systems framework is. And then I'm gonna bring um, Jessica on to talk specifically about kind of the undercurrent of this work, right? We're talking about redesigning and doing school differently forever, but there are some really major um, kind of foundational elements that I think we have to pull apart in the equity domain and really have honest conversation and dialogue. So we're gonna set that up and then you'll have an opportunity to dig a little deeper into the interconnected systems framework by seeing um, the application at the district and school level in, in the subsequent sessions. So I wanna start out with a message of hope, right? We have this potential right now to reverse all trends um, and create a healthier way forward, right? We have accumulated wealth of knowledge with one common theme, and that is to make people's environments more nurturing. How do we create an ecosystem where everyone 
thrives. And so I love this quote from Tony Biglin. I also want us to keep another message of hope in mind that although it's gonna take a lot longer than we initially kind of anticipated to recover, the most common outcome from disaster is resilience. And this comes out of the research in this area um, from Kira uh, Malseth out of Washington State. And again, I just wanna keep this message of hope populating throughout our journey because we're not gonna lie, this is complicated work. It's going to be messy at times. It's gonna be frustrating, but um, you know, our kids are worth it. So I think one of the big takeaways from this conference is that um, as a community, we've gotta be um, disrupting status quo. We've gotta always be asking questions. Is this really best for kids? Do we really have youth at the center? Do we really um, have environments um, where everybody's emotional needs are getting met and keep coming back to that question about those foundational elements that um, as we redesign and reimagine the system forever. I also want to acknowledge that the federal level, um, Secretary Cardona is doing a, a brilliant job of leading kind of the big messages that we have in the interconnected systems framework and in PBIS and MTSS. And he offers this in the past student access to structured mental health services in schools hasn't been implemented in a functional way, right? We have been working in a parallel universe. And we oftentimes think of it as something um, that only a, a small population of kids need, but that's not the case. And I think over the last couple of years, we um, have realized and recognized that. And we've got the opportunity now to redesign schools and make sure that mental health services are a core part of the school's DNA. So how do we pull in social, emotional, and a healthy system into the fabric of the academic domain? And we've been on the path to doing this for many, many years. And so um, with the help of the Center for School Mental Health and leaders at PBIS, and thanks to Mark Weiss, and Lucille Eber, and Nancy Lever, and, and Sharon Hoover, and Kelly Perales and Katie Pullman and Jessica Swain Broadway and all these people, we have designed a structure and a process where we're bringing teams to deliberately apply the multi-tiered PBIS framework for all social, emotional and behavioral interventions, right? Putting everything under one umbrella. We're aligning that into a single system and we're doing that across the cascade of implementation. And this work is absolutely driven by the active participation and decision-making, situating family and youth as essential feature. So really that consolidating of teaming structures, data systems, and making sure we're invested in one common way of work. And so I realized that this graphic is really, really busy, but I want us to think about that intentional um, alignment and integration. And MTSS, right, multi-tiered systems of support has really gotten popular. And my fear is that that popularity has only breeded fragmentation. I feel like we have pop-up MTSS in each of these different domains, right? And we've been doing this for many, many years, right? In RTI, we had teams that were focused on content areas like literacy and math, who were uncovering strengths and needs who are using evidence-based curricula, who are designing explicit instruction routines in the classroom, increasing intensity of supports, and that they were having teams make decisions about what and how to implement to support those needs. At the same time that was happening, the same thing was happening in the PDIS sector, and the same thing was happening on mental health teams. Now it's time to consolidate. It's time to bring technical experts around one school improvement team, one single system of support, where we have effective teams who are co-designing their effort with youth and family and community members. And we do that across the tiers. We wanna take full advantage of the community data in addition to the school data the family and the youth and the community give us that broader context, that broader lens, so that we're not sitting back and waiting for kids to fail in our system. 
we're actively pursuing and uncovering the strengths and needs of our community and programming for that by fortifying and strengthening our tier one before we kick it up a notch. We're gonna to use together a formal process for selecting and implementing evidence-based practices, but we're not gonna rely on just one person to make decisions by themselves. We're gonna bring them onto the team to make decisions together about what the evidence-based menu of options will be across the tiers of support. We're gonna make sure that we're, gonna, we're using universal screening that allows us to uncover students with internalizing and externalizing needs. And we're gonna use that data to inform tier one instruction. Again, we can't just sit back and wait for kids to fail in our system. We have to be proactive. We have to really design a system that's upstream. And when we initiate an evidence-based practice, we have to really put in those evaluation metrics before we start. How are we going to rigorously progress monitor for both fidelity and impact, regardless of who's delivering that intervention, no matter if it's an academic support, a social emotional support, or mental health support? And finally, you know, we're asking our teachers to do things we've never asked them to do before. And many of our teachers are so comfortable bringing in social emotional behavior and mental health supports into their classrooms, but so many of us aren't. How do we provide adequate training and coaching? How do we make this feasible and doable? How do we design a marketing plan side by side with our youth that destigmatize what mental health is? You know, when we bring our mental health partners into the space of school, we demystify what's going on in the, in the mental health space. And it turns out they're using an instructional approach just like we are inside the classrooms. So how do we design that single system of support? And this is a little less busy of a slide. And I'm just, again, wanting you um, to think about ways that we've structured our system and ways that we can be working more effectively and efficiently. And really anchor those guiding principles on the core features with everything that we're doing. When you're designing a system of support of, for staff, really building that collective care for staff, we're still going to rely on those core features to guide the process. So those core features end up being that binding ingredient, right? That glue that binds all of the, the way of work together. So again, ISF, just like PBIS and MTSS, is a structure and a process for education and mental health and other child serving systems to interact in a more effective, efficient and comprehensive way. It's guided by key stakeholders who can make decisions, who have the authority to reallocate resources, change role and function of different staff in our schools, who have the authority to change some of the policy, right? So again, it's not anything new. It's enhancing our current MTSS approach and working um, more effectively and efficiently. It's also guided by four key messages. Again, I continue to emphasize that single system of delivery where we're consolidating and investing in one set of teams across all tiers. But it also means that our success is defined by our outcomes, right? Access is not enough. And too often in the mental health space, we count the number of kids who are accessing services and calling out that our outcome. It's not good enough for our kids. That would sort of be like counting the number of kids showing up for reading class and calling that our outcome. No, we need more than that. We need to make sure that our students are actually benefiting um, from what we are designing in, in, inside of our school. So success is defined by outcomes. Three, mental health is for all. And I don't think we have to sell this one quite as much as we had before. I think we're all recognizing that each of us needs skills and strategies to overcome stress and anxiety in our lives. And that's true across the lifespan. But we also each have a role to play in incorporating mental health into the fabric of our education community, right? 
And that translates into the fact that wellness is a skill. It is a set of skills. And as educators, if we can teach reading and math skills, then we can teach wellness skills. And so mental health is for all. And then finally, number four, as I've kind of stated in the prior slide, the core features are that binding ingredient. And they're going to be absolutely necessary to guide us through the installation of school mental health into the school improvement process into your community. So this is a new slide that we're kind of geeking out um, about. And um, we've just updated our page on our pdis.org website. And again, we're, we're going to touch on this and take a deeper dive into this into um, the other sessions that you are going to be hearing and learning from today. But across all tiers, we wanna make sure we're crystal clear. We wanna move away from a co-located model to a fully integrated model where school and community clinicians are embedded members of our school community, where we're, even if they're community employed, they're still part of the fabric of our community and they are serving across the tiers of supports where youth families and community provide that expanded context and participate in all decisions. Right? Imagine if our youth had decision-making power. We heard from our youth panel this morning. They are ready. They're ready to give us feedback and input. And they have so much insight about what we can do differently moving forward. And that same um, um, passion is there with our family partners, right? We just have to be going to them and inviting them in and giving them and holding space for them to be active members of our community. We really want our teams to use a formal evidence-based protocol for selection, delivery of interventions across all tiers. And again, that continuous monitor for fidelity and outcomes. And you can see we've explicitly stated with what the teams, the systems planning teams do across the tiers in the items below. And again, you'll hear more about this in the subsequent sec um, uh, sessions today. All right, so as I um, end my kind of intro and turn it over to Jessica, I want to end with this critical message. We all need to be bold, right? This is the time to redesign and do school differently forever. It wasn't working for so many of our youth, for so many of our staff. We can't return to status quo. So let's make sure as a team, we create norms where we're calling out practices that are not in line with our values, that we're always asking ourselves, is this in line with our valued outcomes? And does this represent our full community? And let's engage youth into every aspect of the redesign. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica Swain Bradway. Jessica, take it away. Thank you very much, Susan. I am going to share my screen. So I can share sound and I appreciate everyone giving me a second while I'm organizing my screen. Um, I, I just really am so appreciative of everyone joining us today and the sessions I got to see yesterday. I have to say I was for certain lifted up and uh, kind of re-motivated by hearing all of your excellent um, sessions and the chat. So uh, I appreciate the setup, Susan, and um, this, uh, this clip that I'm going to share with us is uh, from the Brene Brown podcast. And some of you know, um, Dr. Bruce Perry does some extensive research and work around trauma, and he and Oprah wrote a book together. And I think that they do a brilliant job of helping articulate the inextricable connection between um, equity and mental health. So I'm going to play just um, a little bit of a little clip here, and then we'll continue on. Let's see if this works. And an over reactivity. And so the reason I think that's an important distinction is that all kinds of people every day have experiences that are little, little, tiny, little experiences where they get a glance that tells them they don't belong here or you're stupid, or you're invisible. And all of these things literally activate your stress response system in unpredictable way. 
And that pattern, if it's prolonged enough, leads to the very same changes in the brain as a big T trauma. Yeah. And I think that that's an underestimated and underappreciated component of the trauma narrative. And so that's why I kind of, I back into it f- from looking sort of at it as a neuroscientist. And, and I think that when you do that, I think it makes it easier for me, at least to communicate to my peers and other people I'm teaching that you can be somebody in an out group and have no big capital T trauma. You can actually have a loving family, no natural disasters and never be shot or raped or a victim of sexual abuse. But if you're continually in a school where you're feeling like you don't belong, like you're not the right color, you're not the right gender, you're not the right religious beliefs, whatever it is, if you are continually in the out group, it leads to the the same emotional, physical, and social consequences as capital T trauma. That is very powerful. Very powerful. Um, I appreciate the research that's been done there. And um, Dr. Perry's comments kind of make me think back to um, a few things that, that we've discussed as, as, as a group, um, particularly Dr. LaSalle's comments over the past few days um, of, you know, the Black House is on fire and keep going and belonging. Um, this, this connection is not just something that we um, want to think about in terms of Um, mental health, but also in terms of equity. Let me move on. There we go. Uh, The Oregon Department of Ed has reflected this approach of the interconnection between equity and mental health, um, as has uh, in in Washington, we have the Mindful State Initiative, where groups of folks have come together to really try to provide support to one another and make that strong connection that uh, we can be well mentally when we've created an organization that supports a system that supports all human beings. Uh, my friend, Jessica, Danny, Jessica yes. sorry to interrupt. Can you share your, uh, you're sharing your screen. Can you yep. get in a different mode so we can see the slide? Oh, well, yes, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Thank you. Up here, can you see my slide now? You're so, you're, yeah, that's better. That's better. Okay, good. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm struggling with my technology this morning. <laughs> no worries. Thanks for letting me know. Uh, my uh, friend, uh, Johnny Fu, who's director of special services, has reminded me over and over again that equity work is SEL work, that the school community is for everyone, um, and that there are some social justice truths, some hard truths that we need to reconcile and be okay with in order to have those conversations. And part of that is about man- understanding and managing our own wellness, our own wellness. So we have space to show up and do the work for our kiddos. And I want to give a shout out to my colleagues, Amy Flamini and Kim Yannick. Yesterday, their session on centering wellness for adults was uh, life-changing. It was absolutely amazing. Um, and they reminded, reminded me and made me think of this idea of we're moving from managing to supporting. We're not managing kids, we're supporting kids. We're supporting one another. And that's something we need to all go in on. But when we talk about trauma responsive environments, and and I bring this language up because some of us are in a position where we're being told we go do MTSS or MTSS a kid or use trauma responsive. And we don't always talk about what that looks like, sounds like. And a lot of us in special education know um, we have this saying called old wine, new bottle, right? So when we talk about trauma responsive environments, we're talking about environments that are focusing on belonging as a protective factor, right? We are creating positive, predictable learning environments. We are purposefully building relationships with kids and families and one another. And we're prioritizing teaching self-regulation and other social emotional learning skills. Um, I see if I can do this. I think that's better. But none of these can happen in an unsafe, unjust, or unwelcoming environment. So I've talked before about um, when we talk about positive behavior supports, when we talk about doing multi-tiered systems of support, it's not just what we're doing, it's also what we're not doing. It's what we're willing to put down and the things we're willing to pick up and put them in their place. 
So with that being said, I'd like to shift to someone uh, who probably can do technology better than I can. Uh, Susan, we have a very special guest with us today. So um, I'm going to share a little bit about our guest and then I'm gonna see if folks can uh, guess who it is. I know his name's in the chat, I mean, in the, uh, in the session description, but just pretend it's not. So our guest speaker, this, this is a fun fact, his last car had a handle to roll down his windows. See if I can do it. He is an unwavering advocate for equity through MTSS. As part of the Association of Washington School Principals, he was a pivotal force for equity and supporting administrators. And the last fun fact is that he dominates in the CrossFit gym. So with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Kurt Hatch uh, from the University of Washington, Tacoma. Dr. Hatch, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good to be here. <laughs> so, Dr. Hatch, you are uh, one of my favorite folks to work with um, in the region. You are uh, really an unwavering advocate for kids and for equity through multi-tiered systems of support. In fact, this uh, amazing quote popped up in a recent publication through the Department of Education. Um, and I, I really appreciate this prioritizing belonging and uh, belongingness and well-being and creating those those environments for kids to welcome kids back. And so I'd love to um, take a few minutes this morning and ask you some questions and give you a chance to respond. And if our participants want to put some questions or, or follow up comments in the chat, that would be great. Um, so our first question, Dr. Hatch, is this is kind of a big one. What advice would you give to districts who are in the beginning stages of implementation? Oh yeah, that's a yeah, that's a big question, but it's I think it's a really good question, um, and it's and it's a reminder I think to me um, that it's important to be really deliberate in the process of implementation. Uh, when I talk about implementation to schools and districts, um, I I tend to help them try to focus on three things, and one is to just really see their system as it's functioning currently. So whether that's through um, looking at certain data points, um, that can be very helpful. And what I think is critical to that is elevating story. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but it goes to the second point um, of not just seeing the system, but really unapologetically um, centering the voices of those whose voices usually don't get centered. So I'm talking about Black and ind Indigenous people of color. So just unapologetically centering their voices, their dreams and desires. Um, and the third thing um, that I think is really important throughout the entire implementation process, because it's, you know, it's a long process. It's a years long process um, that we continually review, um, but it's to be very, meticulous about our implementation. So meticulously implement, see the system, unapologetically center the voices, dreams and desires of BIPOC students and community members and staff, and then meticulously implement. Um, and then some other thoughts come to mind with that question. Um, and one is to take really take time to understand what ISF, MTSS, PBIS, what they are and what they aren't. And when we, we talk about systems change, that's really what we're referring to with MTSS, et cetera. We're talking about changing the system. And, and, and actually, if I'm being more meticulous with my words, I'd say we're replacing a system that um, does not work. Um, and we're replacing it with a research-based proven system that does work. And so, we're really talking about a systems change where we don't do systems change um, all that often in schools and districts. Um, sometimes we think we are when we're doing something like a curriculum implementation, um, but that's not changing the system. It's bringing something into the existing system and just adopting it. Um, so a couple more thoughts that come to mind. Uh, it's critical to work in teams when we're talking about implementing um, these new systems. And so we have to really create, um, meticulously create uh, working teams, shore up our communication streams so uh, the teams can interact 
um, as teams and amongst themselves. So they're communicating really well about the steps they're taking, who's responsible for doing what, what the timelines are. So now I'm kind of going into implementation science. Um, and um, validate the things, the hard work that staff is already doing. You know, when we move into um, the process of change, um, there is a fear of loss, a loss of some of the things that have to do with the culture, systems that are already in place that for some folks um, provide comfort and have been working well for them, um, despite the fact that they might not be working well or as well as they should for students. Um, so be mindful of that and recognize it and have conversations and really good communication about what it means to experience um, a sense of loss. And I had mentioned um, centering voices. So it's really helpful to bring in testimony from adults and particularly students who've experienced the, the success, the change, um, and kind of the uh, collective sigh of relief that comes over time when we're implementing ISF, MTSS, and PBIS. My favorite quote from a student who just um, approached me one day, this was back when I was a building principal, and she said, um, you know, I just want to thank you, and this was a, a fourth grader, I just want to thank you for the new things that we're doing in our school and we were implementing PBIS. Um, and she's, and this is a student who um, really wasn't on the radar as far as, um, you know, behaviors that were not promoting learning. Um, she was fairly quiet. And, but she said, thanks for implementing these things. Thanks for putting these things in place because this school feels so much more calm now. And she's right. There was just this sense of calm that gradually washed over the school that parents and students and staff could feel, and therefore they never wanted to go back the other way. And that's what the testimony that I've heard countless times from other adults and students who've experienced this change, um, they'll say they never wanna go back to the way things were, even if they can't uh, specifically implement it. So bringing testimony, um, and of course make the data visible so you have some things to celebrate. Um, celebrate the stories of change as you talk to people and say, hey, how was it for you before and how is it now? So we're elevating their voices and valuing story as data. And then I think I love what Susan said earlier at the opening. Um, doing all this can really help people, uh, staff dwell in a place of hope during this implementation time because it can be pretty rocky. Thank you, Kurt. I want to um, repeat some things you said because they really stood out. So you talk the centering voices. So, and and uh, Dr. Ruthie Pino Simmons was chatting this during the opening video of, of centering student voices and testimonial as really important data, things we should be honing to to help us uh, create an environment that really reflects kids. And I am glomming onto that one for a second because I, you have often talked about having cultural sensitivities when it comes to MPSS. And I think you just kind of led us in that direction of the testimonial and the voices of the stakeholders, our kids, right? Our most important stakeholders in this instance. And so I'm wondering how, how you've been involved in those conversations. What are your thoughts? What are, what are you hearing? And, and what is your response when folks say, you know, how do we make this culturally responsive? Or what do you mean by culturally responsive? Can you give us some, uh, give us some insights there, Dr. Hatch? Sure. Yeah, I, I'm happy to. And I'll just start off by saying, you know, there's not, and, and, and maybe this goes without saying, but there's not one or two things that we can do to just make PBIS, MTSS um, culturally sensitive. I think what's important is that we're also, we start off by being very specific with the vocabulary that we're using around these topics, because um, it can create um, some pretty strong emotions when we start talking about uh, cultural sensitivity or uh, a word that we used to use um, back in the day, multicultural, multicultural education, um, equity, equitable practices. Um, however, we're more moving into something that I think is helpful to be specific about, and that is um, anti-racism um, and creating sense of belonging. Um, 
but I think we just have to recognize that there are things that have been happening um, in our culture, in our society for a very long time that makes certain folks suspicious and wary about um, new systems. They're wondering, and I'm not speaking for all people of color here, I just wanna be really specific, um, but my, in my conversations and just my own, um, my own thoughts around this are, if we're not talking about anti-racism um, during the course of implementing anything, um, then that's gonna be problematic. So we just have to open up that conversation and look at the data in our schools. That'll just confirm that Black and Indigenous students of color have been underserved. Um, and many would say um, that this is uh, an oppressive educational system that they're in. And it's hard to argue against that when we have you know, decades and decades of the same data, whether it's in education or um, healthcare, our judicial system, our financial systems, housing, um, all that data shows the same thing. And it's that um, Black and Indigenous people of color um, have been subject to oppressive conditions. And so if we just lay that out on the table, um, sometimes that can help folks enter in the conversation. Folks that might not want to enter in the conversation, if we're not going to go there and just be real, um, when we're talking about MTSS and PBIS. Um, and realizing things like racism in and of itself is an adverse childhood experience. It's an ACE. And so we want to make sure that any system that we implement is directly addressing um, those hardships and those things that are cis bound into the system. Um, but what I'll also say, and these conversations are important and people are having them, I know in Washington state, um, coming together to look at things like the ISF, um, things like the TFI, to say, are there things in here that we need to um, carefully look at that as we implement them as systems change, um, do they need tweaking? So they are more sensitive to the current issues at hand that make uh, school for many students oppressive. I'll also say that we want to make sure that we don't classify MTSS, PBIS, and ISF as um, instruments of racism um, because they're not. Um, what we experience, though, is in the implementation phase, our biases as people have, who have been socialized on race um, can definitely um, get in the way. And what I like to tell people is uh, MTSS is like, or PBIS is like using a blood pressure cuff, right? The, the cuff works. I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what it's called, but it works. We find it in every hospital, every um, medical, in every medical room, EMTs have it because it's the best way to measure blood pressure. And MTSS, ISF and PBIS are the best ways of doing school. Um, that The jury is out on that. Just like the jury is out on the blood pressure cuff, we just use it. However, and, and in and of itself, that blood pressure cuff does not create racist outcomes for people. But what can cause racist outcomes and bias is how a physician might use that blood pressure cuff or that physician's bedside manner when they're putting on the cuff and having conversations with folks and how they're making them feel like they belong in a certain place um, and the treatment that they get over time. So I'll just, I've been talking about for a while, so I'll just stop there, Jessica. <laughs> Kurt, I could listen to you all day. Um, and I appreciate, I really appreciate these comments um, in particular about, we could use our systems right now to reproduce oppression. And that's a term I'm borrowing from Dr. Muhammad Khalifa. Um, his book, Culturally Responsive School Administration or School Leadership is a great resource. And he really unapologetically, to steal your word, um, unpacks this idea of what you just described, 
perpetuating implicit bias. And um, also, as you described really well, are those frameworks are not inherently racist or biased. Um, we have to actually hold ourselves accountable for the outcomes of all of our kids and every, every subpopulation in that school, that triangle, here's my triangle sign. When we look at that triangle of, of success, of risk, and we're looking at our kid outcomes, we have to say, what about how does a triangle fit our black and brown students who have IEPs? How does our triangle fit our LGBTQ youth? What, what are our proportions there? Because um, you love to talk about uh, there's no PBIS light. And I, I really appreciate that, Kurt, because you remind us that fidelity is, is not like if we get to 50% fidelity, we don't see 50% success, right? It's a threshold that we have to reach. So what I'd love to shift to the next question is, is if we're gonna be successful with this work, what do we really need to pay attention to, Kurt? What, what should we be honing in on and really giving our attention and then concrete action steps? Because remember, Dr. Kent asked, reminded us yesterday, we can't just say the words, we have to take action. So what's your opinion on that? What should we be, what should we be paying attention to? Yeah, you kind of helped me with the kind of a thought segue into this uh, question because yeah, there is no such thing as PBIS light. Um, however, I've seen, um, unfortunately, um, quite a few examples of uh, folks doing their best. And I think it's important, you know, as um, any leader or somebody who's helped leading implementation to, to give ourselves grace and time and patient, patience, but also recognize that there is a right way there is a best way um, to do school. And PBIS, MTSS is the best way, just like that blood pressure collar. We don't, we don't uh, monitor blood pressure um, in any other way with reliability. We use that tool. Um, and so helping staff understand that we have to be all in and meticulously implement PBIS. Um, and fortunately, it's all been spelled out for us. It's all been developed in ways that are so helpful that if we follow um, the implementation guides, we will be successful. Uh, if we do it with intention and give ourselves grace, time and patience. Um, but also, <laughs> you know, my, with the with comment of there's no such thing as PBIS light, it reminds me of a comment that my grandma says, and she says, you know, either you is or you ain't doing it with whatever you're trying hard to do. And that's the same thing with PBIS and MTSS. Either we're doing it because we're doing it with fidelity, and then we can be really confident that we're going to get results or we're not doing it. So let's not call it PBIS. Let's not say, hey, we're doing PBIS. You know, we've got some really great systems for giving kids, you know, good news cards and tier some tier one things. But we're, we're, we're in the process of implementing PBIS, but we're not doing PBIS. Okay, so enough of that. Um, some other high leverage uh, steps that I have found to be really impactful. One is help staff um, understand the difference between punishment and discipline. So I just want to be really careful on how I um, use those words because um, words matter and we have to be really clear on our vocabulary. So when I talk about punishment and discipline, I talk about punishment as um, something that essentially when you when somebody does something, you uh, respond to that with something that's painful, uh, whether it's mentally or physically painful, that's punishment. And discipline, the root word of discipline is, is means that you're teaching. So you're creating disciples. So you're helping whoever it is learn. And I think it's important to recognize that most uh, folks in education, myself included as a teacher, um, we're never taught the difference between punishment and discipline, and we were not taught how behavior functions. So this is another point that I wanna just throw out there. We need to understand the function of behavior um, and that it is a tool for communication. 
and that there's best and right ways to proactively put in systems and create environments that will increase behaviors that promote learning. And there's right ways and best ways, proven ways to respond when students are trying to get their need met through behaviors that don't promote learning. So understanding the difference between punishment and discipline and really being clear that in most um, teacher training, um, in most teacher training, um, we learn through our student teaching methods of classroom management and we adopt those. So most classrooms will be using um, even versions of name on the board with the check next to it or pull a card or change it from green to yellow to red. Um, and those systems just don't work. Um, and they're a source of trying to augment behavior through punishment rather than teaching behavior, rewarding behavior that we wanna see and help students replicate that behavior over time. Okay, so punishment versus discipline, teaching the function of behavior. And just a high leverage step that I've seen uh, be really successful in schools or when they just go for it. When I say go for it, they just set a goal to eliminate the use of suspensions. And they understand and they help people understand that when we suspend or we exclude students, whether it's excluding them from the classroom, excluding them from um, aspects of the building, like in school suspension, or we exclude them from the school, itself, um, that is a uh, method of ostracizing students, ostracizing and shunning, and that is punishment. And we know that punishment doesn't work. And so therefore suspensions or exclusions don't work. And uh, I think it's really important to note that with ostracism comes extremely powerful emotions. When we're ostracized, um, the area of the brain that responds to pain uh, physical pain is activated and it has really detrimental effects over time, um, emotionally and physically. Um, and again, it doesn't work. And so, you know, in the medical community, when we do things that don't work, that's called malpractice. So we just have to be blunt with that and say, we have to stop doing things that don't work and then help the community and staff move through that space to adopt things that do and help them navigate that sense of loss and all those good leadership steps that we know how to do in order to enact real change. Um, and then just lastly, three things that I think are more obvious, but if we're intentional about them, they really help. One, create teams. I've mentioned that before within your school and with other schools. So you can then, and this is the next point, celebrate your progress your intentional progress and being very meticulous about what progress looks and sounds like over time. And then, and this is really fun, advertise what you're doing with the community. Let them know, make your leadership and your work known and your success known. Um, and I'll just end with this one because I've already mentioned the TFI. Um, enlist the help of a coach or coaches who've gone through this and done it. Okay, I've got one more. So I got one more. This one really was helpful. So I have to say this one. Limit the people who can write major office referrals. It can't be everybody in your school. Um, in the schools that I was leading in the past, it was no more than three people, myself, assistant principal, and sometimes counselor. And I can talk to people more about that if they want and how to um, initiate that change, but it's been very helpful. Okay, I, that's it. I, I love that, Kurt. Um, I... I I, as I'm sitting here reflecting on your words, I think that um, one of the easy things we could do is look and aggregate at the office referral patterns as we're looking at requests for assistance. Because I really worry that we, when kids are showing that they're hurting inside, we over rely on exclusionary discipline practices with kids of color and with, it, with kids who generally internalizing like depression, anxiety, we kick it up a notch in terms of support. So I wonder how we can put together maybe a co-response model where yes, we need to make sure that our, our environments are safe when kids are having those extreme 
behaviors, um, but we need to, to have technical experts who are there to kick it up a notch and support all youth in, in kind of that equitable way. So can you speak to kind of that co-response or have you seen in your experience um, uh, that shift or change? It's in terms of the co-response? Yeah, we're just having teams kind of look at the data to see who's getting support versus who's getting exclusionary discipline. Yeah, it, I mean, it's always powerful to just make the data visible and have staff chew on it. I think as, as leaders, anybody that's in a leadership position wants to be really clear on what the goals are when we're putting data out in front of staff. Um, but yeah, I, you know, and this creates a sense of uh, teams coming together when they have a shared mission and they're putting uh, data on display um, maybe in their grade level team, you know, for example, and they're saying, what's our, what's our goal? We have these statements of values for our school and what's our goal when we're coming together um, to, to co-develop what we can do in our, in our team. Um, well, I tell you, I've really, um, one of the outcomes that people have talked about in these settings that I've been involved in is, hey, you know, we're really relating to each other much better through this co-design process and we're feeling more accomplished. Um, and I think that's really helpful in um, creating um, a culture where you can just um, continue to implement change because there's trust and relationships built. I love that. Thank you. That's great. Um, we've got a great question from the chat I wanted to pose since we're kind of talking about this right now. Um, in talking about punishment versus discipline, there is... Um, there's a mind mindset shift that is required there. And so, and I hear this a lot um, when we remove a kid from the class, well, I'm protecting the rest of the kids learning time. You know, I'm protecting them because that kiddo is acting out and the, the other kids are gonna think they can do that thing. So how do we, uh, what do you think of, how do we shift mindsets in these systems? You did talk about looking at our data together, uh, building teams and having that communication. We wanna get folks in, in that position of understanding that, that punishment doesn't work or maybe we need to think about working differently. What do you say to that, Dr. Hatch? Um, you know, I, I try to be, I try not to be just short with my response when folks are talking about that because I get it. Um, it's whenever there's just this behavior event in a classroom um, that's very emotional or kind of explosive, you know, words being used that are, you know, that some folks would find very offensive, chairs being thrown, those things are tough. And everybody's emotions elevate and they're, they're, they get heightened. And <clears throat> I think it is a legitimate sentiment to be worried about the other students and their learning and say, hey, I need, I need these students not to be exposed to that because it impact their learning. Um, but of course, then we're ostracizing that student that is removed from the classroom. And I'm not saying that uh, students should stay in the classroom if they're throwing chairs. There needs to be a process of really safe and respectful extraction of that student. And you know, those are different things that we can, we can talk about. Um, but what I'll also tell you is when I've interviewed students who um, have been in classrooms where there's a child who does have pretty explosive behavior, um, one of the things that worries them the most is, um, and I'll just, I'll just presume that the student was male. One of the things that worries the other students the most is um, what's happening to Johnny after he's left? Where did he go? And am I going to be removed from the classroom if I make a mistake? Um, and this is, you know, and they're not articulating it this way, but they're, they're feeling that this is, this is supposed to be one of the safest places for me where I have the deepest sense of belonging, you know, which is an innate need that we all have. And so, it, and, you know, it just doesn't work. I know teachers and others, they want this behavior to go away. They might not know how to address it. And so when we give them the tools and understanding of how behavior functions, how we create environments, and then helping them realize that often the behaviors that we're seeing are triggered within the environment or by our adult behavior, then that gives us some tools um, to respond better. And so then the behaviors just decrease and then the adults start to feel more comfortable about, hey, I don't just need to call somebody and have Johnny removed or kick Johnny out because I have tools. 
And so it's just this process that builds over time. Um, but I think just being honest that ostracism doesn't work. It doesn't work for the students who are watching it happen. Um, it doesn't work for the student that it's happening to. And if we're in a profession of doing the right things and the best things, the things that have been proven, um, it's imperative that we adopt other strategies and not just say, um, okay, I don't know what to do, um, but what I do know is these other students uh, need to learn. Uh, it just doesn't, that this statement just doesn't add up anymore, although I understand where it's coming from. Yeah, I appreciate that, uh, Kurt, a lot. I think of um, when I hear people say, but this works, what they're talking about as an educator is I'm being reinforced through the removal of this kid because I don't have all the tools. And I appreciate you talking about tools. That takes time. That process takes time, right? We have tools of relationships and the tools of the instructional strategies we use. And we've talked about how wellness is a skill and we can use those instructional strategies to build that. You know, I think a lot about how nuanced our social emotional skills are. I wonder often if adults are able to articulate how they feel in a given moment and respond appropriately to that. Um, so it, it's very nuanced and it, it, this stuff does take time and purposeful attention. Um, so one of our, one of, we've got some great questions coming into the chat that I wanna make sure we, we get to. Um, and this, this next one I think is gonna speak to some of these and then I'm gonna loop back and bring those in. But uh, you kind of spoken to some of these throughout, are there some systematic obstacles to implementing and doing this well? And we did address mind, mindset there a little bit. What other obstacles should we be aware of? Because we, we can prevent or mitigate, right? There's some of those obstacles. Yeah, um, and before I answer that, I just wanna touch on one thing that you said, um, and that is um, doing the things that work. Um, I think it's really important that we clearly define what we mean by works. Um, and so back to the scenario before, if we're just wanna quickly extinguish a behavior and remove that behavior by removing the student, we can say that that works. Um, but if we're talking about teaching students pro-social behaviors over time, and so they're able to individually um, make choices based on, hey, this will get me what I need, this won't get me what I need, um, this will not get me what I need. Then if we're defining that as what works, then we have to shift our um, strategies towards what works. So just wanted to throw that in there, but to, you know, to your question about obstacles, um, I've been spending a lot of time recently um, really working with schools and talking about one um, aspect of the system when we're trying to see the system um, that really is an obstacle that folks are having a tough time overcoming because it's really ingrained. Um, and so to, to elevate the notion of story being powerful, I want to I want to tell a little bit of a story um, about uh, that involves uh, special education. So there is um, the special education, the tests in special ed that are used to quote unquote qualify kids or um, you know essentially they'll get labeled with a, what's called a disability and then they'll get put in certain areas of our school or get certain resources and this isn't a comment on special ed teachers or aspects of the system that people are really working hard on but there is an obstacle and one of them is the uh, psychometric um, test that we use and I think it's important to really understand the history of that because those are essentially IQ type tests. So IQ tests um, and those were IQ tests like Stanford Binet um, has a long history. It was developed by a person named Dr. Lewis uh, Terman um, who was working at Stanford for decades. And as a um, psychiatrist, psychologist and being able to measure intelligence was and still kind of is like the holy grail for that profession. How do we measure intelligence? And so he was going after that as a researcher and professor and um, uh, created a new iteration of the Binet test. So it was called the Stanford Binet test because he was at Stanford and it really helped put Stanford University on the map. Um, and then another gentleman by the name of Dr. Clarence Gamble over at Harvard um, just a couple decades later was a contemporary 
of Lewis Terman. And he put the weight of the Procter and Gamble resources. He was part of the, um, uh, he, so Dr. Clarence Gamble was part of the family of Procter and Gamble. And so between Harvard and the influence Stanford can bring in, the endless resources of the Procter and Gamble family, um, they really put the IQ test of Stanford Binet on the map. But what um, uh, folks didn't realize in their quest to measure intellect um, was their other motivation. Um, and so it was kind of this um, coming together of these two powerful um, doctors who believed in eugenics. Um, and so eugenics is essentially the belief that there is uh, superior races. And so they put together um, a lot of resources to say, we need to be using the Stanford Binet. Um, and there's an unfortunate history behind that, um, not just because uh, how bad eugenics is, um, but it also um, ended up with thousands, tens of thousands of people um, being sterilized, folks that were housed in um, really poor mental health institutions. Um, and so there's Supreme Court decisions that you can look at that really show the really tragic history of eugenics and IQ tests being used. Um, and then we have these tests now. Um, and we've used the Stanford Binet in schools and it's still being used. Um, the Weschler is being used, the Weschler Intelligence Scale, um, the Kaufman, Woodcock Johnson's being used. These are all iterations of IQ tests. And by the way, um, Houghton Mifflin was the publisher of the Stanford Binet. That's a really um, well-known publisher. Um, Pearson publishes the Weschler and the Kaufman. Um, and that is a subsidiary of the Houghton Mifflin Company. So we know that psychometric data is often viewed as objective. The data that we get from these tests that are used to qualify students. However, there is no inherent meaning or statistical validity with the psychometric data because they derive, the information is derived um, th their significance only just from our interpretation. So that ambiguity coupled with the racial bias with, you know, we're talking about equity has caused millions of, of students from particular ethnic groups to be placed in inferior education programs and special education programs. And that is exactly what eugenics was intended to do. So I just wanna pause there. So we're really thinking about what's happening in the system right now and seeing this as an obstacle, um, these tests as obstacles. Um, so I've elevated this in the form of sharing this story, um, but there's also you know, endless data that confirms all this. We know there's a disproportionate percentage of students of color classified with disabilities. Suspensions are twice as high for students classified with disabilities compared to their peers. And one out of every four um, black students classified with disabilities are suspended. And we also know that educating students with disabilities in separate settings um, doesn't give them an academic advantage. There's no studies that show that it does. So I think by being very specific and shining light on these tests, one, they don't work because we don't need to know all that information that it gives us to really confirm what we already knew about that student before we put him or her into the pipeline of testing. And that's, they still just need to learn how to read. So moving from an inclusion quotient, which ISF, MTSS and PBIS can help us expand our inclusion quotient, getting better at including versus the intelligent quotient that is just by design um, segregates and puts students down this path that it's very hard to recover from and it's linked to the school to prison pipeline. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Hatch. I don't know if you can see, <clears throat> excuse me, the pathable chat, but it's blowing up. People um, are really appreciating your words, um, and I'm I'm taking away that one of our one of our biggest obstacles is to hold on to these very harmful practices that we know result in inequitable outcomes, 
Um, we're not changing our day-to-day -day instruction for a kid based on an intelligence test, right? We are assessing and admiring. We are assessing and classifying. And then we change our mindset around what that kid deserves or what we provide in terms of support for that kiddo. Uh, so I really appreciate that. Um, we have some questions I want to make sure that we get to, and, and this is this is an alignment. It, when we have things like uh, fighting, or we have some big behaviors. Um, we, we, there are some safety issues there that we need to address, but do we have, um, do you have a perspective on if we put a kid in, in school suspension or out of school suspension for something like a fight, what are our, um, kind of responsibilities when we have that kid in that space or when we bring them back? And this is also a question I think Susan can help us with, and it's popped up a few times in the chat. So Dr. Hatch, if you would kick us off, that would be great. Sure. I, you know, I think if, so we're talking about if a student is in an in-school suspension, there's a fight and then we're trying to figure out, okay, what do we do next? And the students have been separated. Okay. Well, I think to the extent that we can replicate the learning environment for that student, it's really important. Um, we need to recognize that, you know, there's something happened that was really upsetting for that student that led to that. So how are we approaching the why? Uh, part of what happened with that child. Um, how are we bringing in parents to have conversations about the why and the hurt that is involved in that? Um, but also being clear to the student that we're not going to have you languish in this place that um, has ostracized you from the classroom. Uh, we're going to try to do some uh, repairing. We're going to try to do some restoring. We're also going to be mindful of the effect that that fight had on the students who witnessed it. Uh, so we can um, navigate our way through um, and then put some things in place that are that are proactive. Um, I think it's also important to hold ourselves accountable as adults for shifting our mindset to, OK, we're just going to put Johnny over here in room 10 for the suspension versus how can we as soon as possible um, get Johnny back into class? And are we prepared with the things that need to be in place before fights happen? Um, that we so that'll enable us to do just that. Oop, thank you, Kurt. I'm hearing uh, relational. I'm hearing instructional. Um, I know people have been kind of blowing up the chat with with information about restorative, and I think that's that relationship piece is part of what um, to me is is such a great link across all of these areas, right? The mental health prevention and response, the relationships, being culturally responsive and equitable relationships. So I appreciate everyone's comments and questions in the chat. And I want to make sure we give um, Susan a little bit of, a little bit of time to kind of wrap us up and move us on to the day. Um, so if there are uh, Susan, I don't know if you see any other questions we want to grab or Kurt. Um, but if not, I'm going to hand it off to you, Dr. Kat Hatch. It is always a pleasure to speak with you. Oh, thanks. It's great being here. Dr. Hatch and Jessica, thank you so much for um, an amazing conversation that's really launching our whole day. Um, one of the things that I'm kind of taking away is the fact that there are so many undercurrents into um, into designing a new way forward, right? And so if we're really going to invest in a MTSS or ISF or PDIS, um, we have to be aware of, are we designing it on a system of oppression or are we designing it on a system of liberation, right? And having these conversations and unpacking some of these historical implications around testing or around um, exclusionary discipline are the backbone as we bring our community and family and youth together to talk about as we intentionally align and, and design the way forward. And so I think what you all have modeled for us is how do we have those necessary conversations? How do we bring all people around the table to make sure that the system is healthy and it's working for everybody? And in the interconnected systems framework, we've deliberately scripted the moves for having a team go through some of these conversations. But again, unless we are really um, getting honest and vulnerable and clear about what we've done in the past and how we've unintentionally designed systems that unfortunately are harming the hurt rather than healing the hurt and specifically hurting our kids of color, we're not going to be able to, to redesign the system in a way that allows it to be 
lifted out of oppression into liberation. And so thank you for modeling that for us. Um, we are going in the subsequent sessions today, we're going to go, um, we're going to take a deeper dive into and learn from other examples at the district and school level. So we hope you'll stay with us. Remember that we have an evaluation. We're always looking to improve this process, but we really wanted to start out with an easy conversation with a little less cognitive load, a little less PowerPoint slide deck kind of action. And we're so appreciative of Dr. Hatch um, for your incredible wisdom and your, your work. Um, we thank you all for being engaged with us um, this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. And we look forward, forward to seeing you in the next session. So with that, I will say goodbye and we'll see you um, in about 15 minutes. Thank you.